Okay, so those of you who are paying attention to USM email, so on a Monday night, I, uh, after uploading Monday's lecture, I add a little short clip to it, posted the whole thing, and I suggested that you all watch before class today. And I just checked uh, two minutes ago, and I saw that uh, out of a class of 34 people, uh, 10 people actually did so. So, good job, people. Um, <coughs> so... The linear equations, uh, this kind of first order ODE, the initial conditions, uh, uh, well, with the coefficients of P of T, Q of T, um, and then later we'll see about the posing initial condition um, as well. And um, what I did at the end of class yesterday, and then uh, did a little more clearly in the clip I added to it, was derive an explicit um, solution formula that y of t is equal to 1 over mu of t integral of uh, mu of t Um, now, in class of Monday, I stopped one step short of this. Uh, what I uh, uh, have here is the simple rearrangement. That's why you should watch what I post. Okay. Um, but, so this is what we're going to work with um, from this point on, where um, u of t is e to the integral <coughs> of P of T, D, T. So you see how the roles that the coefficients P of T and Q of T play um, in the solution. And this is called an integrating factor. Okay. Um, now, um, on, on the one hand, um, you know, what, I, what I did on Monday was, the, the goal was to see what kind of equation we could obtain an explicit solution formula for, like this one, and then go ahead and do that. Um, now, today we're going to segue into, okay, how do we actually apply this formula on some examples? And I know that's a problem, kind of problem that you guys all like, um, that that's all you ever want to see of math ever for most of you. Um, but that isn't all of math, and my job is to show you the whole thing. So, um, so if, if you're lost right now, now is not the time to panic. I'm, I'm Covering a whole canvas here, and I've only covered a small part of it. The rest is going to be filled in over time. So, okay. So, hang in there. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, in fact, um, let's do an example right now. Um, so I have y prime plus <clears throat> one over t one is equal to sine t. Um, and we're assuming, I'm not going to impose an initial condition here, we'll do that later. Um, but, of course, we need to assume that t is not zero. We're going to go with t positive. Uh, so if I were to impose an initial condition, it would need to be uh, for some uh, positive t. So, 1 over t is our p of t, and sine t is our q of t. So it fits this form. Uh, therefore, I can use that this explicit solution formula. Uh, so the first thing I need, of course, is my integrating factor. So mu of t is e to the integral of my p of t, which is 1 over t. Okay. So what happens to this when we work it out? Yeah, the integral is natural log. Yes, it simplifies to t. Um, that sort of thing is going to happen a lot. These properties of uh, uh, exponential logarithmic functions come into play in these kind of examples. Or a lot of times you just have something else that's simple to integrate, like e to a constant. So you get e to a constant times t. There is a seat up here, over there, wherever you can. Okay, or that's fine. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Next. 
I don't know if we have 34 people sitting here, but that's how many are in the class. Um, I did the same thing last semester in 280, where I count attendance for a certain portion of a grade. And some people would uh, say, oh, the videos are there. I could just watch those and not come to class. And that does tip it to your grade a little bit, so think twice. OK, so we have our integrating factor. Therefore, we can just um, plug these in here. So we have uh, 1 over t times the integral of t. And then we have uh, q of t is sine t. So we can go ahead and fill that in. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now, um, here's where I bring back some pain from an old calculus class. Um, you have still to evaluate that integral. How would you go about that? What do you need to do? Integration by parts. Good. So, um, integration by parts. So you have to pick your u and your dv. Um, for this kind of integral, what should be the u? T. I think I heard someone say that. Or well, I'm just imagining things. Wishful thinking. Uh, and therefore, the rest is the dt. Uh, when you have a power of your variable, a power of t times a sine or a cosine or exponential, always pick that to be the u because the power will keep decreasing by 1 until it's gone. Um, now, I won't go through the details of integration here because you're a little bit past Cal 2. Uh, so, but if you were to work out the integral, um, you would have. Um, u times v, which is minus t cosine t, and then the integral of uh, v uh, du, um, and that's going to give you sine t. Um, and don't forget your plus c. Um, one very common mistake is you have this integral to evaluate, and the whole thing, plus c included, has to be divided by the integrating factor. Okay. Um, so what we have here, uh, this is our final answer. Uh, this is, so this describes all solutions of this ODE fit this form. If you were given initial condition, then you would use that to solve for a value of C. Okay. <clears throat> then all the work I was done to come to this solution formula, now you just uh, work with this. Okay. Um, a lot of times, with these kind of linear equations, uh, um, technique is developed where you um, multiply by integrating factor and do a product rule reverse and so forth and all this gobbledygook. Um, but you always end up here. So just learn this. OK. Um, so in fact, that's gonna, what I'm going to show you right now. But first, any questions about this example? So if I return to mo for a moment to the original, uh, general first order ODE, I'm deliberately leaving some space here. And then um, multiplying through by the integrating factor, mu t u t, u t. Um, the integrating factor was found by solving a simple differential equation, which I worked out on Monday. Um, because integrating factor satisfies this. Mu prime is equal to uh, p mu. So what I can do is I can replace this with mu prime. So I have mu y prime plus mu prime y is equal to uh, mu q. Now, what is this? So can you recognize what this is? That is a product rule for differentiation that you learned a long time ago in Cal 1. So that is the same as mu y prime that's equal to mu q. So then you can just integrate both sides. And that is another way to see um, arrive at the same in a, uh, solution formula, that y of t is 1 over mu of t mu of t. All right. And 
point this out because you all know the product rule, or you this is better. Um, <laughs> you never know. Um, but uh, those means it's easy to recognize in reverse. And being able to recognize these things to work backwards uh, can often be uh, very helpful. Um, now, okay. Now, in real applications, we just don't ha we don't have just a differential equation by itself. We have what's called an initial value problem. So that'd be the same kind of we'll do the same kind of. Um, linear uh, first order ODE, but then, uh, and we'll say for T, okay, should be at this lazy. I actually put my T dependence in here. All right, for T greater than some initial time, uh, T naught, um, and then we have the initial condition, y of t naught is equal to some given value y naught. So, so t naught and y naught are specified in the problem. And any exercise section in the textbook book, sometimes going to hit you initial conditions, sometimes they won't. Um, and that's uh, true on a test as well. So what you can do is the solution formula is going to be the same, but what you can do to take the initial condition into account to get an explicit solution formula for this is... Instead of doing an indefinite integral like I did in the example, we can do this as a uh, definite integral. Okay. So my solution I can write as um, 1 over mu of t times the integral. Use my initial time t naught as a um, uh, actually. I'm not going to do that. Not yet. You know when I broadcast something live, it's sometimes do it on a five-second delay or something in case something not toward happens? Just take notes that way in this class. Uh, <laughs> you'll save your eraser's life. Um, okay. My college roommate never used uh, pencil. He always used pen. Um, he's a math professor, too. Um, I just need to give myself some more room here. Okay, so I have y naught plus and then I'm going to integrate from t naught to t. So this is my initial time, whatever it is, serves as the um, oh, hold on a minute. actually, hold on a second. Um, okay, I'll come back to that later. And then we have mu of, and watch what I do in the integral. I'm using t as my variable out here. I'm using it as a limit of integration. What that means is you cannot use it as your variable of integration. Over there, it was fine, because that's an indefinite <coughs> interval. This is a definite interval. Rules change a little bit. Q of s ds, um, where my um, integrating factor is defined in a similar way. Again, I need more room. My integrating factor is e to the integral. And now this will also be um, an indefinite, uh, sorry, a definite integral of p. Okay. Um, now, um, the reason why we define this way is this helps ensure that if I plug in my initial time, what am I going to get? What happens in an integral when the upper and lower limits are the same? Zero. The integral is zero. Therefore, one. Yeah, so e is zero, which is one. OK, so the initial time, I plug that initial time into here, and this is going to be one. And then this is going to go away. And therefore, all I'm left is the initial value, which is what I want. So uh, specifying these integrals in this manner 
lets you, it gives you a straightforward way to see how the, how to take the initial condition into account. You're not having to solve for C and make some algebraic mistake. Um, okay. Now, um, And what you can do is, and this I won't do it here because, but it's, it's in the notes. If you go back through what I was doing on Monday, um, and I'll give you a quick idea uh, right here, that your um, f of ty, which in this case is defined to be mu of ty minus um, and then we have the integral, this definite integral over there. And since it's a definite integral, I can specify some arbitrary uh, constant k. And the idea is k is chosen to satisfy the initial condition y of t naught is equal to y naught. So this is worked out. This is page 15 in the notes. Uh, so the rest of the details are there. So the point is, you can see um, I have two ways of running a solution formula here using indefinite integrals and uh, definite integrals. Um, so, um, so this is something that's good to learn for the test. Is, um, in fact, you can just go ahead and uh, know this. Um, so then you can work out those kind of problems look at each one. <clears throat> okay. And also um, in the notes uh, what I do is I take this solution formula and verify that it really does solve this problem. Now I already talked you through it for showing it satisfies the initial condition but you can also Go ahead and take the derivative of this and confirm that it satisfies this too. Again, I'll refer you to the notes um, on that because that's not the sort of problem I have you work out on a test. So I may give a problem to verify that for a specific problem, you know, here's a given solution to this problem, verify that it's a solution. You'll see there are some homework problems like that, uh, but not like a general solution formula. Okay. Oh, this board was so clean. <laughs> okay, so I hope you got all that because you're going to have a hard time reading anything else. Um, now, if I don't show it on camera. Let's look at another example. Um, y prime plus y is equal to t e to the minus t um, plus y. Um, so um, those of you who have not had class with me before, See how to distinguish. So these are my t's. These are my pluses. Um, also, that is not a two. That's a partial derivative symbol. This is a two, or how I write them anyway. These are my z's. Um, and uh, sometimes people have trouble distinguishing my a's from my q's, uh, which got me to a lot of trouble one time at a lecture at Stanford. And maybe I should just do it like this instead. <laughs> um, but, so, so that's the Dr. Lambert's penmanship guide for now, installment one. Um, okay, so um, in this case, let's see. Yeah, I want to have an initial condition. Y is equal to equal to, y of zero is equal to two. So this is my t naught. This is equal to my y naught. Okay. So what we could do is just go ahead and apply the solution formula that I wrote. Over there. So y of t is well, mu of t, whoops, not sure what that was. Oh. Always watch your font size. T 
naught to t with s q of s to the s, um, where the integrating factor e to the integral t naught to t p of s ds. So let's work this out first. Um, so, okay, so um, to keep in mind what is what with what all the symbols mean. Um, so this would be e to the what. So don't let me work it out. Just like we're just filling in blanks right now. We'll deal with the, do the integration later. So what integral am I putting here? Class participation is a beautiful thing. No. Seriously, what am I putting here? You're just mapping this to the problem. So I, I didn't mean, okay, I'm not, don't, you're jumping ahead. Sorry. That is correct, but I'm not going to work it out. I'm saying when I replace things in here, What do I put? This is straight substitution, people. What? T naught is zero. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, that is still T. Yeah, the initial value comes into play later. Um, and then what goes here? What is my P? No, it's not Y. It's what it's multiplying Y. One. Yes. Yes. So our general form is y prime plus p of t y is equal to q of t. Okay. So whatever is so p and q never have a y in them in this kind of problem. Uh, they're only functions of t or x if that's what the problem in the textbook calls for. I always use t. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm looking for. All right, just filling in the blanks. Now you can go ahead and work out the integral, and if I were to uh, be completely anal about this, because the integral of 1 is, is s, because ds. So s with limits 0 and t, fill in the limits, and you get what you said earlier, e to the t. Okay. So e to the t is our integrating factor. So now we can go down here and start filling a little blank in the solution. Now, we have 1 over e to the t, but don't write, e, don't write 1 over e to the t. How should we write it differently? Yeah, negate the exponent. Okay. e to the minus t. And now I'm remembering when I was in seventh grade, a uh, rap teacher insisted, don't say minus, you say negative. And that was really drilled into our heads. And when I get to college, my calculus professor is using minus. It's like, oh, well, OK, I'll go with that. Um, <laughs> Okay, I see the rest of you was schooled so well. Um, all right, now what do I put? Applying this formula. Two. Yeah, that's where the initial value comes from play. Two plus integral from zero to t. Um, and then we have um, our integrating factor. U mu of t is e to the t, but then here we have e to the s. And then we have q of s. So that would be s e to the minus s plus 1. OK. Um, so now you have your solution. The only thing that remains is to, um, is to evaluate the integral. And of course, this problem is contrived, unlike the last example, to make sure that things work out nicely. And no, I don't always do that on a test. Yes? Um, of oh, this? Um, here. Uh, this is q of t. But it's, a, it's the same function plus q of s is what the solution formula calls for. So s is substituted for t. And I'm doing that just because I have t already in use out here as an upper limit. He has a question. Yes. Um, where, when you put d, s, where does 1 come from? Oh. Um, Okay, this? Yeah. 
Um, if you match this against this, the question to ask is, you want your P of T, what is multiplying Y? Well, in this case, there's an implied 1 here. So that's your coefficient. You have a question. Okay. Um, so now, if we go ahead and simplify the integrand, okay, so we have a nice cancellation of exponents here because we're adding these exponents. So you're just going to have s for your first term, and then e to the s, we're distributing, for your uh, second term. Okay. All right. Um, and now, you go ahead and perform the anti-differentiation. So that would be, um, well, what, okay, what's the antiderivative of that? Sorry, what? Square root of plus C. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a bracket there. Um, S squared over 2 plus E to the T with limits uh, 0 and, oh, that's E to the S. Um, so now you can plug that in. Uh, common pitfall here is that now when I plug in the limits for S squared over 2, I'm only going to get anything from the upper limit because the lower limit is zero. But then the exponentially actually do get something, so don't forget that. Um, so at least um, I'm hoping that your notes are not going in a strange direction like I am. But okay. Um, so then we have t squared over two plus e to the t minus, uh, and then we plug in zero, and all we're going to get from there is one. Um, and then you can um, simplify that uh, to get the um, final answer, which is, um, and so if you want, you can, uh, okay, so 2 and the minus 1 will combine to get uh, uh, 1. So your final, final answer is going to be e to the minus t plus t squared over 2, e to the minus t, Plus, and then this times this will give you one. Okay, so that is your final answer that satisfies the ODE and the initial condition. Now, you can use the upper solution formula or a version of it that uses indefinite integrals. The only difference is. In addition to an integral like this, if it's indefinite, you'd have a plus c here. And then you'd have to apply your initial condition to solve for c. Okay, so that's another way to, to do it. I don't really care which approach you use. Okay. All right. Questions about this example? That is s to the second, right? Um, yes, it is. Um, yeah, just from integrating S. Okay. What did you do with the zero? Um, Is that the minus one? Yeah, because when I plug in zero, this won't give me anything. And then I have e to the zero, which is one. And because it's a lower limit, it's subtracted. So yeah, so this, is, this here is the only contribution from the lower limit. Um, oh, that came from over here, my initial value. You don't have to add it to the 1. Uh, oh, I did. Because, so what happens is, okay, these two terms combine to get 1. Then all that's multiplied by e to the minus t, which is where this term appears. Yeah, so, by, so that, that, and that give me that. Distributed. Yes, I distribute it. Yeah, I combine like terms first. So e to the minus t. So combining these would give me uh, 1 plus t squared over 2 plus e to the t. And now I see if I distribute this through all that, you get this.
Um, Alright. Do you see where it got from here to here? Hmm? Do, you see, do you see where it got from here to here? Yeah. Okay. Now, see where it got from here to that. That's not big enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, all I did was distribute the e to the minus t through. But one comes about from e to the minus t, and then this e to the t was there before. Any other question? All right. Um, okay. Um, these notes are online, right? In the website? Um, yeah, on the resources page. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, that's essentially what I'm following. I mean, there, are, there may be times if, if I. If I go off script and like do a different example, um, then what I would do in that case is I would write that up after the fact. Um, and so the um, and so I think I mentioned this once before. The notes are on the resources page of the website, um, and then. Um, if I did, now this hasn't happened yet, but if I do something else, um, like something that is like a, something significant, like a, like working through a whole example, but it's not in the notes, um, I will post that on the uh, examples page, um, and then later I would go back and incorporate that into the notes. Uh, there's always room for more more examples. Um, okay, and then if that happens, I'll let you know that I did that. Um, so you can see there's something here. Okay. Um. I seem to be missing a page here. And in fact, it's. Hopefully, it'll be easy to just go back to the notes right now. Ah, yes, it is. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I was just missing a little bit of page 18. So. Okay. All right. Um, solution except now I want to do it for a, a still having the initial time being t equals zero but the initial value being something le le left general um, so uh, not necessarily um, uh, not, not necessarily two now so we can take a look at the behavior of a solution depending on what the initial value is Um, so, uh, so if that could be, um, because the initial value itself has very little impact on what solution looks like in, in terms of a formula, because I have this initial value sitting here. This integral is what I spend most of the time working out. So. Once I get to this point, only here do I actually do anything with the initial value by combining this term uh, with this one. So if I were to retrace my steps and just have y of naught equals a generic y naught, everything here would be exactly the same up until this point. Um, and if you're not sure about that, um, you're welcome to try retracing through the steps yourself by leaving at 2 as just a general y naught. And what you would get is... So I'm just going to back up a couple of steps. So I have e to the minus t, and then I have y naught, whatever that is, and then the rest of this is the same. Okay. Um, 
and then I'll go ahead and uh, carry out the uh, distribution like I did before. So I have e to the minus t, y not minus 1, and then I have um, uh, e to the minus t, t squared over 2, and then e to the minus t times e to the t is uh, just 1. So this is what my solution looks like for an arbitrary um, initial value, uh, y not. Um, and uh, what we find here is what I want to ask is what happens as t approaches infinity. Um, how is that? Uh... Wait. Yes. Okay, that's right. Um, so as, as uh, t goes to infinity, uh, what happens to the solution? What goes away and what sticks around? Um, yeah, uh, because as t goes to infinity, e to the minus t goes to zero. So everything is going to go away, that term, regardless of the initial value. If the initial value happens to be one, it was, there was nothing there in the first place. And then um, uh, this also is going to, um, is, is, uh, going to go away. And then this is the only thing that uh, remains. So, so y of t, so, so we can say in calculus 1 terms, the limit as t goes to infinity um, is 1. Um, so in fact, if you were to draw a, um, a direction field, or preferably have software draw it for you, uh, such as like I do in MATLAB, or like I did in the... Uh, Notes. Um, we have okay, here's my t y plane. So here's one, um, and we have um, all solutions, no matter where they start, tending towards uh, one. And so on page <coughs> seventeen of the notes, I have a plot of a direction field that uh, shows the behavior. Um, so long time behavior of solutions is often um, of interest. Um, I should mention that um, if your coefficient p of t is equal to some value a, which is just a constant, then that means that the solution is almost certain to include term of uh, factors of e to the minus a t. And that's what happened in this case. p of t was equal to 1. And so we saw factors of e to the minus t throughout the solution. So that's something you can uh, count on in general. OK. Is there any questions about the long time behavior? Okay. Now, throughout this first real chapter that we're doing. We don't really count chapter one because there's hardly anything in it. Um, chapter two, about, it's all about virtual equations and we're just getting into now, this is the first uh, section. Uh, what we're going to see is certain types of equations for certain solution techniques. And uh, the idea is, this is born for a test for instance, uh, you want to try to classify that equation as quickly as you can. Is it a linear equation like you saw today? And there are other types that I'm going to show you uh, later. So, we, so your first kind that you can record in your mental cache um, is a linear equation where we have y prime and then we have some function of t multiplying uh, y. Uh, and then the next kind that I'm going to spend time on starting uh, on uh, Friday is called a separable equation where y prime can be written, and I've mentioned this before as a product of a um, function
function of t and a, a, a function of y. So then you can isolate y on one side and t on the other and have a relatively simple approach to uh, integrating that. Um, but I want to spend the rest of today uh, focusing on an equation that really is of both forms, uh, linear and separable. Um, so y prime is equal to some coefficient that I'll call a of t uh, times y. Um, so you could fit this to either one of these forms, because for the linear case, you can say p is equal to minus a. q is equal to 0. Um, and I can also say, if I want to fit it to this form, I can say that a is equal to g, and then h is equal to 1. Um, so that's how you can fit to either forms. And we've seen this kind of equation already, because it's the equation that we saw um, for getting your integrating factor. So deep down, you know what the solution is. Um, and uh, I went through a solution process on Monday, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But I'm giving special emphasis to this, because it's the kind of equation that comes up all the time. Even after we move on to more complicated problems, this is something that still plays a role. So the general solution is um, y of t is equal to um, a constant times e to the integral of a of t dt. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to write it as an indefinite integral. Or if I really wanted to, uh, as I've done before, I could write this in terms of an initial value. So y of 0, whatever that may be. And then I have a definite integral, um, e to the integral of uh, 0 to t of a of s ds. So either one works. Um, if, it, if you have an initial condition in mind, this is the easiest way to take it into account. If I had a different initial time that's 0, I'd put that down here, and I'd also put that down here as the uh, lower limit. Um, now, um, I'm pointing this out because it's something that really needs to be burned into your brain. Uh, it, it, it happened whether I'm teaching this class or if I wasn't teaching it at the time, but I'd be helping students with it because I seem to be helping students with every single class in the STANG department. Um, <laughs> I've become so good at modern algebra, even though, even though I've never taught it. Um, I've never taught statistics here either, but I spent so much time on it. I now teach a workshop on it at Stanford every summer. Um, and, um, and, this, and no matter how late it is in the semester, students always have a need to solve this equation. So I, I point this out, like, okay, this is something that you, know, you saw at the beginning of the semester. You need to know the solution to this. And they're like, um, and so that, that's why um, it, if you learn nothing else from this class, no this, because it's such a fundamental uh, differential equation. Um, it's almost as fundamental as one you kept solving, whether you knew it in this way or not, in Cal 2. But if you have y prime is equal to just plain old f of t, so there's no y anywhere else, um, that would mean that y of t is the integral of f of t. So that extremely simple differential equation you were solving every time you worked out an integral in Cal 2. Um, so after this one, um, this one, where y prime is equal to y times something that doesn't depend on y, is also of prime importance, especially when um, a of t is, is a constant. Uh, so y prime is equal to a y, then y is equal t is equal to a constant e to the a t. Um, so. That's something that needs to become second nature. And what I'm hoping is that you'll come across it often enough so that that will just stick with you. Um, but uh, it's, it's little things like this that if you know off the top of your head, like I said, to keep in your, your, your cash, if you will, um, that could save you so much time. And of course, you like that for a test, but it's helpful in other situations too. OK. Um, all right. Um, any questions in the last two minutes? Okay, I'm good. Go. <laughs>